but we're going to start off um, with one particular article. We've been discussing um, the kind of very uh, difficult ways in which the word public uh, is used, misused, uh, mistaken, overused, uh, assumed to be something. Uh, it's kind of a, a very basic piece of our urban design vocabulary, you know, public space. And it's politically vital and socially vital that we understand what's involved with the term public. Um, I look at it, um, this semester we started off by looking at pedestrian spaces specifically, so there could be a little bit of a, a, a focus. Uh, that's why it's called pedestrian rhetorics, which is that many spaces that are pedestrian only tend to be the ones that we as urban designers focus on which is not to say they don't want to look at streets where there are cars, but in fact, one of the responses to changes in the, the desires and aspirations for public space has been to uh, actually place limits on transportation, especially the cars with respect to open spaces in the city. So we've been looking at all sorts of projects, we've been looking at various histories, and um, one of the terms that has come up uh, is this idea of the commons. Another word that kind of uh, is emerging uh, as a kind of um, counterpoint, let's say, if we take the public space debate and pair it with the usual private space, and you have public and private, or semi-public and semi-private, uh, sometimes those uh, distinctions, um, we, we assume things, uh, historical trajectories or particular audiences. And in some ways we forget that um, the history of public space is um, also a history of exclusion, different forms of participation, uh, different forms of technology or lack of technology. And that around the world, uh, the term public space is actually highly differentiated and, and highly fraught. Um, and uh, so, Last week and then this week, we're looking at this other term, commons, and seeing if it helps us refine some of our categories, refine some of the ways we think, and for the students' uh, analyses projects to think about how the word commons uh, might help us think differently about some of the work. And I think um, it's not always going to be um, distinctly something that we can look at, the commons or the, the verb commoning. Um, but it's a it's just a, a useful um, kind of parallel lens. So uh, we read an article um, which I'm happy to share with all the guests. I can um, send PDFs uh, to you after, after afterwards, and it's called "Reclaiming the Commons." So there's a long history to the term "commons" as well, um, and its historical role in changing the nature of ownership and 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 questioning how um, tenancy and uh, uh, um, stewardship work with respect to shared spaces. <clears throat> so I'd like to um, start uh, the, our class discussion uh, with a uh, having us kind of uh, go backwards in the articles to start with um, the um, there are three examples, and we'll start with the last one. The first example in the paper is Times Square, which is, you know, that's the kind of uh, ground zero of all sorts of tensions and fun about public space, but we're going to end with that today. In between, the second one is uh, a play space in uh, Queens in uh, Jackson Heights, which some students may actually be more familiar with. And then uh, we're going to start with actually the most um, <clears throat> Uh, digital version of all this, which is a, actually an online site called 596 Acres. Um, and so let me um, see if I can't master the screen business. Um, okay. I want to change, screen change. No, that's not it. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna start just with this simple image. 
<clears throat> and um, five, for those of you joining us, uh, 596 acres. Well, wait a second. Why don't I get a student to explain it? What a great idea. Can somebody help me out here and um, give us an introduction to 596 acres? Well, I'll get it started. Try. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Bless you. So it's an, it's an initiative started by, uh, I think, two people. So they just mapped all the open public spaces or like open spaces in Brooklyn. And it counted to 596 acres. And they started with this tagline that states that there's land and you could use it if you wanted. So I think something of that sort where, yeah. So, so it's just a initiative where you could just get the land and you could do whatever. You, I mean, it's not like you could do whatever you want, but you could you could facilitate the conversation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can. Oops, lost that. Okay. <clears throat> Um, in a little more detail, uh, what um, 596 Acres was started by uh, someone who is an attorney, uh, Paula Siegel, and she started in Brooklyn where looking not just at open spaces, but open spaces that didn't actually have access. So um, open spaces that were either community gardens or uh, more likely fenced off lots which is a, a typical condition in many um, uh, kind of underserved communities and recognizing that those lots were owned by someone uh, and whether it be the city itself or by private, private landowners. And so um, the, uh, <clears throat> the living lots was a way to um, help people access and provide information about the location of these empty lots. And so, uh, you know, here's uh, block number 624, several lots owned by the city of New York, but it's actually um, um, underutilized or worse, uh, um, kind of, um, in this case, it's, it's become a kind of, uh, a, a, a playground, but it's actually not uh, an official New York City playground. Um, it's a kind of a, a mesh between the city and a private a private user. And so, 596 Acres is trying to try to create a database that people could contribute to and use uh, in order to take action about it in order to say, hey, let's turn this into something. And so um, in some cases, uh, what you'll see is, let's find a community garden. So here's a, a city owned lot that is just kind of, um, a, a city owned lot that actually has, um, it's technically owned by um, one city agency, but is, but is more or less empty. And so 596 Acres uh, be, sought to place itself uh, as an intermediary for people to, um, to be able to change, you know, change the use of these things. I'm looking for, um, here's another one. Where, here's an instance where, um, it's owned by a, a church and it's become a community garden. And so this is one of the, those kinds of examples that the, the 596 people are really were really seeking, which is that how communities are taking the initiative to uh, turn uh, lots into useful spaces for their communities. So can, can, can someone kind of take off on that and, and, and put this into the, the context of commoning or what is the process that we're talking about here from 
with respect to action in public spaces? Um, when when we were reading about this, um, when we were reading this article uh, for today, um, one of the conclusions was this um, idea of identifying opportunities as a way to showing or yeah advancing hope. So I guess this is a great example of how uh, to see opportunities in places that are not so that are or empty or are usually related to bad things like empty lots or people where can congregate and assault someone. Instead of doing that, these people are trying to uh, give it a more positive outcome by um, giving the, lot, the knowledge and the power to other people. Like it's just a seed and then other people take over. Okay. Yes, uh, I'm building on that, not just the tool, uh, not just the place, but the tools as well. Because the online map and the fact that you can give them data makes it more uh, like playful and more engaging for people. Because you can supplement whatever you see if you are working in the city with the information you find online, or the opposite, you can find it online and then you're compelled to go there and see how it looks like. You can find them in your own neighborhood. Yes, and also the fact that they were, um, they started also a, um, a more not so digital platform like um, guerrilla tactic on the fences of these places, posting as if it was digital, if it was a news feed of the lot, but on the fences it made it uh, it makes the project more accessible to people that don't have access to digital tools so so um what candelaria is referring to is that one of the tactics used uh by 596 was to encourage people to um if a place was not accessible um to uh put up a fence, put on the fence, put up signs, let's say, uh, um, you know, you could you be using this lot. Let's see if I have uh, one of those. Uh, I mean, their, their goal is, was, is to, uh, um, is to encourage people to, to recognize their power merely by sharing information, by um, by uh, organizing around, uh, um, let me just get back to a different image, sorry, the original image. Um, so, so the idea was that, that um, this group would um, publicize, even by putting on, on fences that were not accessible to them, it publicized the idea that, that this could be uh, used land. This could be useful to a community. And so uh, this, uh, they, they started in Brooklyn and then they moved to, um, they did some work on the Lower East Side of New York and then eventually, um, I think that right now they're not active, but their archives are still available. Uh, they lasted about five or six years, which is a question that we should all be thinking about is when we talk about organization and urban intervention, uh, one of the problems that we can see in today's examples, but we've seen all semester, is the problem or the question of what is temporary and is temporary uh, useful? Is it is it a mixed blessing? Is it is it necessary? The things that are temporary uh, put them in a different category, let's say, but maybe that category is also quite useful. Um, that that temporary changes um, this, the article makes some argument for, which is that small scale and temporary are actually a part of a larger trajectory of change. Um, <clears throat> this, um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Sorry? Just, to go, just to go to the oh, yeah. other side of the spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. At what point this becomes a tool to create a critical mass in order to not momentarily, but uh, 
to effectively change ownership of a specific private lot? I think that would be ideal in some ways, but ownership has its own problems as well. Uh, it comes with responsibilities. So in some cases, there's two kinds of owners, I guess you'd say. One is if the city owns the land. So um, this is not just New York City, but in, in many cities around the world, m much of the land, open land or built on land is, is publicly owned. And so that's one set of, um, one set of constraints, but also opportunities uh, because neighborhood groups uh, often don't have the capacity. It, we, we'll come to that question in the uh, Queens um, example. And then if it's a privately owned uh, lot, uh, that's a whole different set of questions, which uh, means that uh, on the one hand, the owner might say, oh, you wanna buy it, make me an offer. But you know that's probably unlikely because neighborhood groups don't have that kind of money. So sometimes, and this, uh, you know, I've mentioned an organization that I work with called the Center for Urban Pedagogy. And one of the projects, uh, we had some high school students um, where we, a typical thing we do is we give them cameras um, and video cameras, um, or now they just use their iPhones, but, uh, but we give them cameras um, because not all have it and go out and start photographing empty lots and then find out who owns the lot. Do some research about the institutional and bureaucratic and market mechanisms that led to a particular lot being empty. And uh, typically the students are amazed when they realize that there's like any piece of land is deeply embedded in all sorts of regulations and ownership patterns and public regulations and dummy corporations and um, uh, the, it's a really good exercise, which is not quite the mission of, of, of 596, but it's a related mission, which is that uh, every inch of land is subject to regulation and rule uh, and control. And if you can insert a wedge into that and say, hey, look, there's other possibilities, you know, then <clears throat> that is a, is a kind of, uh, something that this article, the term they use is called is disruption. So perhaps someone could help me out with that word disruption in this context. It's a, it's a paradigm shift. Um, it sort of throws out these little, I guess, micro societal dynamics within that neighborhood by being a change and bringing in different players, potentially people from outside the neighborhood. Um, it changes, I guess, a system within a bigger system, possibly. Yes, yes. <clears throat> the um, disruption is an interesting word, and this 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 article makes a big point of using that word. Uh, and it's funny because uh, much of the the terms about the new economy, you know, the kind of uh, techno uh, digital economy is about disrupting is also about disruption that a startup company will disrupt um, an economic model and disruption being a good thing uh, which is funny and to begin with so in this uses the same language which is the disrupt disruption of what they call um, stable systems and so uh, that's a really fascinating concept because we, we think of stable systems as a positive thing. And in many ways, stable systems are needed for society to function. But it also hints that sometimes stability also means inertia and means lack of action. And that disruption becomes a way of changing a system through destabilizing it in some way, uh, which turns out to create uh, new opportunities, new changes, new audiences, new ways of, of participating. So uh, it's a really, um, I was kind of taken aback because I think of disruption in that kind of gig economy startup language, but actually this is a kind of disruption as a, as a community uh, goal, which is to, to get involved with institutions and change them. <clears throat> 
or change the way they work at a very local level. I mean, they're not overthrowing institutions, they're, they're changing them and, and for, 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 um, for what they hope will be the better. And I think that's a really um, useful concept from this article because it, there's, a, there's a couple of points where it says, we want to disrupt the resilient system. So that's almost backwards from the way we often think about, you know, creating resilience. Um, but they, the, the article, the authors let us know that sometimes resilience can be a form of inertia, as I mentioned, that prevents change. So uh, there's some good dynamic, a, a, kind of, a kind of language problem there about what words we use and how we think of them. But um, in this case, um, there's a good shift to understanding uh, let's say good resilience, if I may use that expression, um, requires periodic disruption in order to show that it is fact resilient. Uh, and it's a large question, I think, that comes from this work. Okay, On so that note, I'm gonna, go ahead. In that note, disruption doesn't mean one thing where you're talking about using publicly owned land and another when you're talking about private property? Um, it, it, it's different because the actors who would be involved, the participants in any discussion of public privately owned land would be very different. In a, in a public, um, in a, in a public uh, land example, you would be talking to city AGs, you would be kind of, um, you leveraging publicness, the official publicness of of the government or profits to uh, put in play different ways of thinking about it. In the private sector disruption, uh, that they're the kind of disruption they're talking about might entail um, one very uh, important way historically is that um, in the 1970s in the United States, uh, community organizations started asking banks to uh, change their loan patterns to put more money into the communities where their branches sit. So there was a, there was a, a history where banks would exist in a neighborhood, but those banks were not investing in that neighborhood. So they were extractive. They were taking money out of a neighborhood, and those neighborhoods were usually poor and they were stressed and under terrible conditions. And so in the mid seventies, there was a community redevelopment act passed that said that if you wanna have a branch on that street corner, that you need to lend in that neighborhood. So that's the private sector getting, being tasked with contributing to a community. And the CRA, Community Redevelopment Act, is still in force, it's still highly debated and in fact, I don't mind saying it's under threat pretty much every election cycle, especially now in the current administration, where the idea of uh, community lending is, is um, uh, it's, it's, it's a way of regulating the private economy because lending is the core of how private property works. So that's a bit of, a, of, of uh, the difference between public and private, but there are both ways in which uh, disruption is basically saying, we need to take the systems that are in place, and and this is kind of a policy question, but it leads to urban initiatives. How to uh, change the way that these institutions or private institutions work so that land or community assets can be, uh, you know, changed and reconfigured and given over to uh, use of neighborhoods. Yeah, so, I think it, uh, was, it was a original point of view of putting it in the way of uh, resiliency, of diminishing the resilience of the already established uh, systems and institutions. Because, yeah, they are resilient. <laughs> they succeed. You know, yeah, it could be that we need to, you know, since we use the word resilient, you know, in, in, in from the opposite point of view very often that resilience is an important thing in ecology and in um, uh, infrastructures and such things. Basically we could substitute the word stubbornness <laughs> and say they're trying to disrupt stubbornness. 
which actually makes it easier since we don't mix our resilience meaning. But it is a good reminder that resilience uh, doesn't always mean flexibility. It could also be resistant to change. That's a great point, yes. Uh, David, I've got a doubt. So uh, good or bad, like just coming to the public-private conversation, is it okay to intervene in a private lot because it's already owned by somebody else? So. No. <laughs> Thank you, Nino, for speaking free market to us. Um, <clears> There's <throat> not a good or bad. It's kind of like, well, you know, intervene. You know, you could say that any form of property is always part of a a network of ownership institutions and patterns, and the state protects that private property. The state in the U.S. anyway, private property is kind of sacred, if you will. That uh, and that is something we see at play at every, to this very minute. That private property is um, something that uh, is untouchable in a way, you know. That, but that's not actually how things work because private property is taxed, private property is zoned, private property has health requirements, uh, private property has uh, you know height and pollution requirements. Doesn't matter if it's public or private. There's always a form of regulation it, that couches property in one form or another so what they're what what the resistance that you raise is like well can we intervene in private property that's a gen that's a general way of putting it but i would say private property is already is already always in play in uh inter, in a kind of an overlap with the public sector and <clears throat> since private property is also part of a a, a consent as to okay people agree that private property is a good thing and that we need it that doesn't mean it can't be challenged you know your use of this property is detrimental to my community okay so what get lost but the community can say well we know that you have a tax deduction that you are taking or that the bank that l is lending you money won't lend me money so you can start to question even how <clears throat> You know, a, a system of capital, which works fine much of the time, uh, also needs to be pushed. And it's essentially a kind of political question. If you want to insert a different value into the use of property, then give it a shot. And I think that's what, you know, 596 is saying is, all right, this land could be used better. And it turns out that this land is uh, actually this in tax arrears which is not unusual in a place like New York City. This owner hasn't paid taxes in 20 years, but the city can't be bothered to go after them because it's too much work and they don't have the budget for it. But if this community starts you know, getting some publicity, then the, the Congress person or the council person would say, hey, you know, this, this, we should take possession of this private property because it's in tax arrears. So uh, even private property, though it is, considered uh, a, a kind of, um, it is an owned entity, it doesn't mean it's not part of a political system where challenges can come from anywhere. That's what zoning is. I mean, and, and in fact, in the, in the United States, the origins of zoning was challenged at the very first as an overreach into the private, into private property. And the Supreme Court essentially said, well, there's something for the public health and general welfare that that should allow zoning there are, you know private property is not uh, outside of the social system and that's what zoning has um, been about that's what community politics is often about is is regulate is cha challenging zoning and challenging land use to more benefit the the general general welfare in the, in the larger public so no we're not overthrowing the property system but that doesn't mean we can't push and pull on the property system because we live in 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 a political condition where that's fair and it changes and it goes back and forth um, let's move on to this uh, second example um, in the reading the 78th street uh, play street um, um, david one more question yes. about the other one huh. um, is there a way in i don't know if the mechanism exists in the united states but like if this property 
is owned by the city or by a person who's not using it and it's been abandoned for some time and other people come and claim it. Is there a way that they get ownership through use over time? Or that never happens? Um, that pretty much never happens because of good lawyers. <laughs> so there's no and, like public mechanism for that. I'm asking because in, in Tibet yes. there is. Like if yes. you have a property and other people come and live in it, for example, I think for over a period of 10 years, if you haven't been able to, to, to kick them out, it's theirs. It's not yours anymore. Um, there, there have been, um, I'm sorry, there are, uh, certain laws and I'm, I'm a little bit out of my depth here, but there is something called common use. I think that's what it's called. Interesting note, the word common where, uh, it, that if you don't use a property for X amount of time, <clears throat> then it can be challenged. Mm -hmm. And that and that happened that has happened historically, but it tends to not get very far in the courts. Uh, uh, there's a famous case in Rockefeller Center. If you walk around Rockefeller Center today, on the on the on the sidewalks, you'll see a, a a kind of bronze insert into the sidewalk that that says property line. And that it's once I think there's a plaque, or there used to be a plaque that said, you know, you you are you have the right to use this this land, but it is still the, the property of, which is which is a, a a response to challenges that said that you know they built their building where open space of the sidewalk was in the private within within the lot, and there was some discussion about um, can could that be claimed, uh, uh, and so. I think that that kind of stuff doesn't get very far in a place mm -hmm. like New York City. I don't know um, how that works uh, in other regions of the U.S. And, and certainly I have heard of those instances in other countries that um, abandonment essentially can lead to uh, 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 the removal of, of ownership. Yes. Uh, Someone uh, is... Then, okay, I will answer those questions. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, just extending on that, uh, in like at least in India, what they do is they like in a lot of cases, uh, especially the real estate market, they don't construct anything. They just leave the land abandoned. They just wait for the property value to go up. So is that is that the motive here too? Because I'm not aware of the real estate, especially in New York. Yes. Um, someone asked a similar question about squatters' rights. There are no squatters' rights in the United States. Some countries do have them, and if you occupy a place um, for some time, then then uh, uh, yes, that is not the case in in the U.S. Um, I am. I mean, there are, there are all sorts of challenges, uh, like I say, but in the U.S., it's very rare uh, because property is considered. Uh, a kind of very, uh, there, someone is asking about this um, adverse possession, which is another form of, of um, squatters' rights. It's a very important political tool in other countries, um, <clears throat> especially um, we know in, as as Antonio was saying, in South America, uh, and uh, in in, I think there's some. Um, in the 1970s, in the U.S. and in European cities, uh, squatters' rights were tested quite a bit. And there's some, actually some good movies about uh, the lives of, of squatters in one of the British cities. So it's, it, and it continues to be uh, important. In, in Berlin in the 1980s and 90s, um, there were squatters who were able to take possession of buildings and were uh, given ownership Although some, you know, at some point they also actually reversed the policies and took the buildings or demolished buildings. So squatting is actually, though illegal in many cases, it still serves as a as a as a kind of temporary commoning of space that challenges the existing institutions to act. Sometimes they act in ways which is not helpful to those squatters, but actually it gets institutions uh, to 
either uh, renovate buildings or to actually uh, change the use of the buildings. Uh, so uh, the whole kind of history of squatting is, uh, is a remarkable um, way of perhaps describing this idea of a challenge to overly resilient institutions. Um, and oftentimes, uh, you know, in the 1970s in New York, actually now that I recall this, there was a, there was a period in which if um, on the Lower East Side, if you um, were able to uh, uh, claim that you could squat through starting a squat and then showing you had the capacity to fix a building, the city would sell it to you for a dollar. So there was, uh, there are these kind of, um, I guess you could say there are workarounds in the, in the tools, in the terms that we use today. And so David, this other project, oh, yes, yes. Please, Can I also ahead. ask a question about this one? Uh, when I read it, I was wondering about the kind of the job of like New York municipality or the, like the planning departments, because I felt like they were being presented in a very positive light for kind of eventually embracing or incorporating the community initiatives. And I was wondering if there have any other uh, kind of responsibilities, because we were talking a lot about these commons and publics and collective and they like the initiatives are always being presented as a holistic thing. And I was wondering if there may be some voices that are not being heard and maybe that's where the municipality or the decision makers uh, job comes in maybe make sure those choices are heard or I don't know, like how, mm -hmm. like what is the kind of the like clerk, yeah, I don't I think, know how to call it, what, what their um, job is. I I think that um, I have an example that might be answering your, your question. Um, <clears throat> there has been a, a, a strong uh, a, a tension um, in New York City. Let me see if I can't even find something. Um, Just wondering if um, it's more than just implementation and funding. I mean, there there, there was a, a period in um, the 1980s and 1990s in New York where um, there's a lot of vacant land that um, people used even before 596 uh, for community gardens. People would just go in and start a garden. You know, it was empty, nobody seemed to care. Uh, there's one on 113th Street, 112th Street, you may have seen that. That started off as like, hey, let's make a garden. And that was a, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, basically nobody was paying attention. The city had other issues and essentially it got in under the radar. But what ended up happening is um, <clears throat> in, the, in the 80s, um, uh, the need for housing, which never went away and is still with us, uh, uh, the city decided, hey, we're going to develop some of these lots. They're perfect. They're not too big. We can we can make affordable housing in these lots, Pub, you know, through through city agencies. And so you had this you had a kind of um, fight among very good people, the people who wanted to build housing and the people who wanted community gardens. And so the city actually had to kind of come in and um, uh, kind of. Uh, negotiate with both parties and some gardens stayed and some gardens did not get to stay and some housing was built and some housing wasn't built. So I think what you're saying, what you're saying is like who manages this kind of the players uh, who claim this open land. Uh, so it's, so for instance, you know, the people who want to put a community garden there, that seems like a great thing until somebody else comes along and says, Hey, we need more housing. So uh, it's not a unified, um, field of of audience or participants by any stretch of the imagination, and I think that's a good question, and thus leads us to this idea that there's a lot of competition, even among you know nonprofit uh, uh, community serving uh, um, actors, and um, that's especially in a place like New York, like many other cities, where there's uh, <clears throat> not a lot of land that is. Uh, well served already by transportation, by infrastructure, 
uh, and so that um, the battles become very, very tense. Uh, that happens a lot with, um, um, <clears throat> not far from Columbia also, there's a, there's some, here's a good, com another story about competing actors. There were some uh, garages on, on 108th Street uh, um, near Manhattan Avenue. And then a nonprofit housing developer came in and said, we want to build some, some low, low uh, income, affordable housing also, and for people with special needs. And so that pit the community uh, against uh, a nonprofit. But the community was um, trying to protect their parking garages. And so that first, that kind of brought out different audiences, like how dare you put cars, you know, ahead of people. And then people, other people came in and said, hey, hey, that car is part of my livelihood. So you get a very, um, there's a lot of, um, of claims that can be made in a, in a complex situation. So 596 is a, is a, was one way in which people could claim uh, uh, kind of uh, the, the right to participate in land use decisions. <clears throat> so, um, in, because of the time, I'm going to go a little bit quicker through the the seventy the car free seventy eighth Street uh, in in Queens uh, near Jackson Avenue. Uh, do any of the urban design students did you were you near the Jackson Jackson Avenue in the summer studio? No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is an instance where. Uh, it's a really good instance um, where if, if 596 was a situation of kind of distributed network of people using the tool, using the, um, using the, uh, uh, the kind of the, the, the internet as a distributed form of distributed knowledge to encourage participation in urban life, uh, kind of moving more towards uh, just the space itself. Th this was a kind of really typical example of how a community saw an asset that they wanted to repurpose in order to create uh, a necessary open space in their community. In some ways, now this is kind of textbook. We understand in urban design anyway that um, these kinds of processes take place all the time. Uh, and in New York City, anyway, the, the city government is much more sympathetic to these than it had been a decade or two ago uh, because of the need for open space uh, and recreation has become uh, much more uh, of, a, of a kind of understood by the, the powers that be as a, an essential form of equity, not just of health. Um, <clears throat> And so in this case, we're seeing uh, uh, how that came together through a very ad hoc situation and then became uh, a kind of local neighborhood uh, nonprofit, then became uh, part of a, a, a nonprofit citywide agency. And so um, what are some of the takeaways that some of you have from this example? Hearing nothing. Uh oh. I think that the power of a community voice, I mean, initially their proposal was knocked down. Um, yes. They were passionate about it and organized and, and kept pushing and pushing. And it sort of then sort of morphed into something where they were able to scale up and, and get the DOT on the board and then it just snowballed from there. Um, so, I mean, it's what? the power of the power of the people. Um, you know, there's some good. I mean, aside from the detail of the of the example, there's some some of the way in which this article frames this. I think is, you know, it, sometimes this article is a little bit wordy. I I, I admit it, um, but they 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 really frame it. Um, you know, we already talked about this idea of disruption. And, um, and this is another example where it was less disruptive than what they call a reconfiguring of existing urban situations or existing urban governances. Um, and I think that the language, some of the terms of this article are, are, are very helpful in understanding um, uh, that the way in which 
the actions of communities to to insert their knowledge, to insert their their rights, to insert their needs, is a um, is a is a <clears throat> um, is a form of participation in governance and policy and space making uh, that has that the authors call for scaling. Right, it starts at the small scale, and then they want or they watch how these things become vertically scaled. Now, the term they use that term vertically scaled, which means that these organizations are start out, you know, let's say at the bottom where they're only talking to themselves about themselves, but they move into or they start having relationships with city bureaucracies, larger and larger city bureaucracies or nonprofit organizations. And so what's interesting about this example, um, and, and, the, and the authors call it, as I say, scaling vertically, they scale up between nested urban systems and integrate with higher level bureaucratic institutions. So this is kind of politics and policy, but it shows you that um, having a spatial idea or, or a kind of planning idea um, in, a, in a complex system requires integration with uh, institutions and power systems and, um, and that to, to create custodianship and stewardship just doesn't happen by you, you know, let's say sweeping in front of your, your 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 street every day but it scales up to have to deal with city officials and that is both a plus and a minus i mean i think what's interesting about these examples is that uh i think you read there was an example where uh <clears throat> was it the city that the, the nonprofit interested in this street had to fundraise which they were completely unprepared to do they didn't know how to fundraise. It's like, we want a place treat. And the city said, sure, we'll give you a place treat. Here's some stuff, we'll help you with this. But oh, and by the way, you need to also start pitching in with fundraising. So on the one hand, it's like, well, you know, Mr. S you know, city agency, hello, that's not what these people know how to do. They, 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 they expressed a need and it's the public sector's responsibility to answer that need and the public sector comes back and says well we can't help everyone and on, for better or worse we live in a time of a kind of entrepreneurial point of view that says you want this you've got to do some fundraising which again is a very mixed blessing uh, <clears throat> as we know competition and such things can be can be difficult um, but one of the things that this uh, organization helped do Okay, I'm going to do one of those screen sharing switches again. Hold on. <clears throat> okay, share, let me share. Okay, hold on, I have to find something. Uh, okay, this is what I'm Sorry. <clears throat> the, 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 um, the, the city said, and there was a, a, um, an attempt to say, okay, we need a nonprofit. We need another organization that can uh, participate in this. And lo and behold, somebody started one. And of course, I have to know about it because it's a cup project <laughs> from a few years ago. Um, I'm going to scroll through this and then I'll show you. <clears throat> um, so you can see here, uh, partnership for partnerships for parks. This organization started out in in the organizations in Queens and other places that said, well, we need that nonprofit to help between the, the community and the city. There needed to be an intermediary to assist. And this is very much the role of nonprofits in, in many places, especially um, the US. And so uh, <clears throat> this, you know, this organization, the Center for Urban Pedagogy came in and, and, and created a kind of knowledge device to say, oh, well, how do you do that? How do you deal with maintenance? How do you deal with capital? How do you deal with decision makers? How do you deal with coalition building? How do you, 
address specific things. And this document was circulated among all the organizations that were trying to uh, get local parks and local um, place, play yards um, uh, made in their neighborhoods. And so, <clears throat> no, 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 no. Stop. So anyway, I just wanted to say that um, the the story of the of the article dealing with um, that um, actually had a good outcome with respect to the partnership for parks becoming a spokesman, a spokesperson, a spokes org for um, for uh, those communities who are not equipped to um, to do the kinds of things that a, a a nonprofit or a government knows how to do, but that with the assistance with with basically kind of civic learning or you could say commoning that that this nonprofit introduced a kind of new level of knowledge to create a kind of commons of shared interests so that the residents with these interests the businesses with these interests the community members with these interests could uh, um, have a means to scale up their involvement um, and this is a kind of example of what i think um, would be called commoning in the um, in the way the the the, the article um, uh, kind of pushes us towards. So <clears throat> finally, um, the uh, the the first example in the reading, what I think is the most problematic and yet also the most interesting, has to do with Times Square. Um, the the uh, we've talked a, a bit about time in our class. I'm always trying to avoid actually because some ways Times Square is ising and incredible, but also most unusual of a cause kind of local asset, but it's really a global asset. Is it an asset? <laughs> um, uh, it's so tied into um, so many intersecting systems and different scales. Um, but this article takes it on as part of this, uh, you know, reclaiming the commons. And I was at first shocked that that um, that, that uh, you know the urban commons could include Times Square in some way. So that was a shock to my kind of own um, um, ideas about what commoning could entail, and even notions of public space can entail because Times Square as the article does eventually make reference to, is not only uh, um, a public space, but it's a highly commodified uh, public space. So, <clears throat> let's see, I'm trying to remember what, I'm trying to see what's being shared here. So I'm going to give you uh, a very short history lesson. If I, Although there's nothing I do that's short, I see I've discovered, but I'll try. Times Square, <clears throat> uh, you all know it in one way or another through movies, through images, through news. Uh, it's a kind of uh, phenomenon way beyond itself. You could say that the image of Times Square is far more uh, circulated around the world than any real knowledge of specific knowledge of economics and politics and cultural disputes and such things, uh, which is what makes it such a interesting uh, um, um, teaching device. Okay. I've got too many Using softwares. Using you, David. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so um, Times Square essentially was an intersection of Broadway and uh, 7th Avenue. And it's not a square, just in case those of you have never been there. New York actually, uh, <laughs> people are always shocked when they come to New York and everything that's called a square is not really a square. Um, I don't actually recall why that's the case, but <clears throat> we get used to it. Um, so this is T Times Square um, in the 1940s. Uh, the center of both images, you see the New York Times building, uh, the newspaper building, uh, and that's why it was called Times Square. Um, <clears throat> um, 
in the 19, uh, from the 1920s to the 1950s, it was a center of commerce uh, as well as a, a, a as well as um, fun. Fun in the sense of becoming full of hotels and movie theaters, especially in 1920s and 30s. Uh, before that, um, live theaters of um, you know comedy and vaudeville, called vaudeville, which is a, a, a form of comedy uh, present presentations. <clears throat> But notice uh, in both these images, uh, it's the cars, it's the streets that dominate. And um, somehow uh, that shows you how the perception of what a proper place could be is, is this, that the cars were it. And the image on the left is a great demonstration that the people are kind of standing there, the car is whizzing by, but because the commerce and the, and the, and the commercial uh, advertisements are so big that it kind of, um, it kind of works, and that became uh, uh, the the means of understanding Times Square was through the the, the billboard, through the sign. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Oops. Okay. Um, in the fifties, this continued. Um, you know, you see a lot more advertising. You see, uh, especially for appliances and cars and liquor. Uh, still very busy. Still very traffic crazy and complex with all sorts of temporary road systems to try to divert cars. Um, on the upper right, <clears throat> um, you can see an, an ad for a movie called The Third Man. I highly recommend you see that movie. It's a great movie from 1949. Orson Welles is in it. But um, it shows you that Times Square became, an, uh, uh, you know, another term for it was um, the kind of neighborhood of lights, that, uh, that it was lit as a kind of, um, permanent uh, billboard or a permanent place of advertising and consumption mm -hmm. and, and uh, theater going and fun. Also during this time, uh, the theater industry um, traded um, in the, starting in the 30s, but especially in the, in the 50s, when on the side streets, not on the avenues, you had many, many, many um, Broadway theaters, uh, still a major industry uh, today. And then down below, just kind of the boring version during the day, uh, but still, you can see the the scale of uh, building to billboard uh, and advertising as a as a kind of form of what uh, a kind of urban entertainment zone can be. <clears throat> this uh, camel ad, uh, I don't think we're seeing it on this one, but some of the cigarette ads uh, had mechanisms to blow smoke through the the person's mouth. Um, that just you know one fun detail. Uh, it's like an early Las Vegas. Uh, it is, except in this case, <clears throat> the buildings are big where, mm -hmm. and at the street, whereas, as you know, from Las Vegas, you had the sign, then you had parking, and then you had the buildings. But yes, very much decorated sheds, as uh, Venturi would put it. But the street, still the dominant armature uh, of the place. <clears throat> um, Times Square went through what we like gen gently call hard times. Um, but in fact, uh, what's, um, what, we're, what, we're, what we should understand hard times to be is not just Times Square having a hard time, but in the 1970s, New York City, like much of the US and, and, and all over the world, uh, went through a kind of uh, economic um, collapse. Uh, for various reasons that had to do with oil, that had to do with austerity policies, uh, that, that uh, social uh, austerity policies that were uh, advocated by governments uh, to, to cut down on social spending and the rise of corporations who uh, took their money elsewhere. So there's a very complex array of uh, politi global political economic reasons uh, that you can see taking place in Times Square when essentially uh, white middle class patrons left uh, either to just not come into Times Square or, or most classically moved to the suburbs. And um, landlords still had buildings and spaces to rent. And one of the uh, changes had to do with, uh, I don't know the, what the right word is, but um, what you might call alternative cultures of uh, um, less, uh, less, so socially accepted forms of pleasure and entertainment. Uh, 
Uh, so very famously, <clears throat> prostitutions, pornography, uh, and all sorts of, um, um, how shall I put it, um, <clears throat> alternative activities uh, that were in the public realm, but uh, in the street, that is. And so Times Square in the 1970s became quite famous for being troubled and, and, um, and uh, uh, kind of, a, as, as the city put it, a kind of uh, a blemish. Uh, at the center of the city. But mind you, the 1970s were also probably uh, one of the most prolific times for the music scene in New York City and for arts and culture in New York City. So um, remember that what when they're saying the Times Square is um, having troubles, what they're meaning is that uh, uh, the powers that be, the corporations and the city itself is not making any money on the buildings and the uses of Times Square. So another way to put this is, is that the the value of land in Times Square, which had been so high, collapsed in the 1970s, and thus other forms of entertainment took their places. Now that kind of thing uh, <clears throat> usually has a kind of arc um, in the sense that quite quickly, or quite, you know, by the end of the 70s into the 80s, there were also um, movements to, to get rid of this uh, uh, alternative form of entertainment and these are just just one image that um, you know against pornography, against the kind of uh, low rent hotels, against the kind of unseemly uses, as they would put it. Um, and so it, it wouldn't it wasn't far soon that um, uh, it was very soon that the city tried to figure out how to repurpose Times Square, how to change it, how to make it more valuable in real estate terms and how to regulate it in ways that were um, that would draw kind of your middle class tourist uh, back to the area. And one of the very famous things uh, which gives rise to a, a whole concept of the role of art is um, when they started when the city started using billboards and art projects uh, and the, on the right you see a very famous example of Jenny Holzer uh, with a with a, a sign, one of the early um, uh, large billboards, the same one on the left, um, to use art to begin to um, notice a place again uh, through artists, and there were programs to use uh, empty storefronts on Forty Second Street as galleries or exhibits for for short term, mind you. And so during during the late seventies and into the early eighties. <clears throat> there were forms of rethinking of Times Square as a place uh, kind of controlled and regulated once again. On the left, a, a pedestrian mall project from 1977, uh, which um, essentially said, <clears throat> here is a way to keep the advertising, uh, to keep something of the spirit of Times Square, but, but make it, uh, close it off to cars. Uh, this idea did not do well at the time. Um, other examples on the right, this uh, proposal to kind of create a space of Times Square in Times Square uh, to create a kind of a massive billboard system that actually made a form of enclosure. I mean, it was a very fascinating time for experimenting. And Times Square was because of its fame, because of the kind of almost global real estate interest in the nature of Times Square became iconic for ways to to uh, change the, the understanding of the public space uh, of Times Square. There were examples to uh, try to um, <clears throat> rezone it, to, uh, to build bigger buildings. And so you see examples here of you know, zoning studies <clears throat> with some idea that they would still be billboards, but it, it kind of, um, this is a kind of half-hearted attempt, yet yeah, the beginning of recognizing that Times Square had a character of some sort that might have been worth keeping, uh, still really looking at the vertical surfaces, not at the life of the street. Uh, and the sun got out of order a little bit. So there on, <clears throat> on the left, you see uh, 42nd Street and its uh, image, the reality of, of the, the the movie, the types of movies um, on the lower right, you see a kind of um, lack of development, which we, uh, that enabled these industries to survive. Um, 
uh, film processing, video, triple X video parlors. And then, <clears throat> but also in the 70s, in the, in the, in, especially in the 80s, notice the, uh, on the upper right, it's a postcard that says NewYorkCityTourist.com. So this is maybe in the, in the late 80s when dot coms actually existed. But the recognition that uh, New York had an image to sell uh, and the internet, which was not new, of course, Times Square was always about selling images, but now it's on a digital, which is bringing that um, imagery into a global audience. Uh, but notice it's always still the billboards and the vertical services, and there's very little to say about the street itself. <clears throat> um, another funny example, um, John Gerde, who's uh, pretty well known internationally for doing large, large buildings uh, in the US, but also in, in Asia. Uh, so this is an early one where uh, the life of Times Square would be inserted into the lobby of, of a hotel, whereas the street itself uh, is almost untouched. It's still that same messy Times Square, which actually some people were quite happy with um, in that in one way. But taking the, the life of Times Square um, and putting it inside a building, which in the 70s and 80s was not unusual that there was a kind of idea <clears throat> A little off topic here, but the rise of the atrium uh, as, a, as a kind of public place emerged in the 70s and 80s when the streets themselves were considered not worth paying attention to. So that actually fuels a lot of the shift of publicness that we still see today uh, in atriums and the, there are a lot of tensions there about public use. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to leave out Philip Johnson's great <coughs> uh, proposition for Times Square which uh, happened in the late 80s, I think maybe early 90s, um, in which uh, the kind of full corporatization of Times Square, these massive buildings where uh, Times Square would more or less cease to exist. And then he called up uh, Venturi and Scott Brown and said, hey, you know, can we use your Apple? And somehow that would revitalize, um, you know, this, give it a sense of identity, whereas these buildings were completely, um, uh, uh, you know, the demolition of Times Square. And luckily enough, people said, oh my God, you know, please, no, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to skip that one. In the 90s, uh, there's the emergence of the recognition that uh, the signage at the street, not just above, was part of the um, the excitement of Times Square, being in Times Square on the street in Times Square was, was part of its allure. In 2006, there's a competition for the, the tickets booth. I don't know if you, some of you have probably been there. <clears throat> it's, this is a rendering, it's not a photograph. And it's quite amazing because it, it's a, it truly begins to activate the life of the street, um, this massive uh, uh, kind of sitting uh, piece of amphitheater that allows you to look at Times Square from amidst the busyness of Times Square. So this is the beginning of, of the paying attention to like what is good about Times Square when you're in it, not just in an automobile. <clears throat> and that brings us to uh, the present, more or less, where starting in the, <clears throat> after the 2008 uh, economic crash, uh, discussions about how to rethink um, Times Square emerged where <clears throat> there was a kind of recognition, not just in New York, but, but all over the world in the early 2000s to basically say, whoa, uh, we need to rein in the automobile, that the automobile is not the main constituent of public space, but people are. <clears throat> so you can see here uh, the firm Snohetta, which is actually spelled wrong, I apologize for that. It's not snow, as in the stuff that comes in the sky. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And so, and what you see here is the the kind of uh, epistemic, the kind of a kind of shift from understanding the street as the public space of the street through the automobile and through the bus and taxi to a recognition that uh, pedestrians are the primary constituents. Notice that this view is from on top of the the ticket booth stairs, so we're actually um, at a second floor level on a public public device, which is this red spot right there. And so <clears throat> I think, ah, yes, 
<clears throat> this continued uh, with a temporary painting of the street. Uh, it lasted about a year, kind of, uh, uh, this artist worked with Snohetta to create this um, uh, kind of installation to, to again, rethink and repurpose the identity of, of Times Square. And, I'm sorry, that's the more, most recent image of um, how the firm Snohetta uh, really um, reinstated the ground plane for pedestrians amid all of the, the business and commerce and uh, visual <clears throat> excitement of the square itself. Now, I'm giving a kind of uh, simple story and I, <clears throat> I think there's two things for us to think about here. Um, one is, um, <clears throat> that this article, I think, uh, I have to say kind of, I'm not sure I'm on board with it. I think it's an interesting, uh, I think the reason to that it is to, to frame the change in time square as a continuum of, of ways of audiences together in the planning process. <clears throat> and so I I'd like to hear if you folks have ways in which you could describe how these authors um, uh, describe the reconfiguration of, of um, Times Square from the point of view of, uh, of commenting. I can't stay on that image because the, 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 the typo is driving me crazy. What I found interesting was it was the way in which there was this massive paradigm shift away from this. I mean, it's still very sort of commercial and everything else, but there was not a great deal of focus on the individual people as a, and a public place. And they went through a process when they closed it down in 2009, 10 to trial a few different sort of options and see, seeing how people use the space and using that as a mechanism to test whether something worked or didn't work to start moving forward with schematic design options to close the street and turn it into an actual full public place it was interesting. And it totally changed the way, I guess, the place was used. I mean, now it is very commercial and it seems that not a lot of New Yorkers really go there. It's a tourist destination, but it's, it is also a very, I mean, it's the most, it's probably the pinnacle of public places in the world, really. Yes. And the authors kind of mentioned that, uh, right? They say New Yorkers joke that, um, you know, New Yorkers don't go to Times Square. I'm looking, uh, sorry, I'm taking a quick shift to find some other images of the, um, <clears throat> of that process. Sorry, this will just take a sec. David, I have a question. Yeah. How much of this transformation that you talk about um, was quote unquote allowed because they just realized it was uh, very hard to look at the billboards if you were in a car. Meaning the whole idea of having more people staying there is that you can have more eyes on the publicity. <clears throat> well, wow. you cut to the chase, right? It's all about commerce. Sorry, I'm looking for um, one other image. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, where did I put it? Where did I put it? <clears throat> Almost there. Ah, 
Are you seeing that? The temp the chairs? Somebody say yes. 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 We are, yes. yes. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so Lena's question is that uh, was this a marketing means of uh, getting more eyes for the billboards? And I actually think that's a fair question, and I but I have no idea. I don't think that it came from that because the only reason I think that didn't come from that was because the businesses um, were unsure if uh, the, the the lack of cars would drain the what they saw as the identity, the kind of constant movement. Um, but I think they saw very quickly um, that, wow, this is unbelievable. So I think very quickly they were on board and supported it very much. You know, one of the things that the, the, the article talks about is the Times Square Business Improvement District, now called the Times Square Alliance. And I think that's one of the kind of key players here. And I think with, with very, very mixed, um, very complex political and social um, um, implications, <clears throat> which is that they realized that Times Square is not a New York business. Times Square is an international global commodity. And so at the same time, Times Square could be packed and should be packed. And they figured that out pretty quickly. And they were the ones who supported uh, Snohetta and they supported the, the, the various attempts at pedestrianization, but only only after the city and, and other um, professionals urged them to do so. Like many businesses, they're kind of afraid of change. Uh, so there's one of those resilient business models, which turns out to be a problem, um, but which uh, eventually came around. And so we see public space here. Um, <clears throat> this is an early test in 2008, 9, 10, uh, where the city just put out chairs. They didn't even paint the streets yet. They, they just put out, um, you know, uh, uh, traffic diversion bollards and uh, chairs and uh, waited to see what happened. And in fact, it, it was it was hilarious. People, you know how, uh, what's the word? It's like, when you, when you take a, when you know you're not supposed to walk somewhere like, and then you put your foot down, it's like, you, like can I go here? Can, can I walk here? And then all of a sudden people discovered they could just hang out in the street. It was a, a, a breathtaking shift because people and it, it, people were, were coming up against their own programming that the street is not for pedestrians. It became extremely popular for a while. <clears throat> uh, even New Yorkers went um, because it was such a, a dramatic um, shift in one of the most, uh, you know, kind of, loved and hated by New Yorkers places um, that you can, you, can, you can think of. So, um, so how do we view this? <clears throat> well, I'm sorry, let me come back to this question of the, the, the Times Square Alliance. How do we view the Times Square Alliance <clears throat> generously for a moment as part of the commons that this article is trying to make an argument about? Nobody, come on. I think the, think ex like the experiment, politics. I think the experiment part was a big issue. I mean, to look at it as a commons, I don't know, because it's like something you do together and then you revise it and you like maybe discuss it in some way. Um, but that's like- Right, it, uh, experiment, temporary. I think the global versus local thing is really interesting in that because it seems that it's like very outside of anywhere else in New York. It's like it could be anywhere. So, I mean, commons, yes, but they even said in the article that like there were no locals involved because there were no local stakeholders in this. So then how it becomes a place in the city, like it's not really in the city. It's in like that weird threshold. I think what you're saying is really important because it was um, 
powered and, and supported by very heavy weighted institutions and agencies from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yes, there is a commons, but who is this commons? Is, are these people in power? But let me read you, um, and I, 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 I mean, I, I admit I, I more or less agree with you, and that's why I wanted us to be shocked by <clears throat> the way in which th this, this project can be put in the same sentence as uh, 78th Street Play, Play Street and uh, 596 mm -hmm. Acres. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just read it up a little bit. Um, Times Square's transformation demonstrates that iterative tactical strategies provide a means for large bureaucracies to achieve rapid urban change, thereby highlighting the transience of apparently stable urban configurations. So here we see that the authors are getting us to see how urban change is taking place even among the powerful. And then, um, Uh, <clears throat> there was one other sentence. I think for me, it's similar to the High Line in some things that, yes, like, of course, the High Line had a lot of issues here in New York. Um, there are like problems with the community that it was supposed to serve and it didn't in the end, and how like projects like that become a different monster. But when you look at them from abroad, like I remember learning about the High Line from Chile and like Times Square, you saw how this street changed and those two became huge opportunities, like not because of the context within themselves, but what other examples can learn from them. <clears throat> Anybody else want to respond? I want to kind of add to what Antonia said. Um, they talk a lot about in the article about scaling horizontally and vertically and I found them both uh, deal mainly with replicability so like the scaling embodies in replication yeah replicativity I guess <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I like I don't know maybe it's a matter of definition but I didn't understand scaling vertically is also replication. I, I thought it was more of like how you, you take like one case study, you understand the mechanisms of it and maybe use the same ones other places and more like bigger scale projects, for example, but not actually replicate the same thing you did in another place. So, so I think the, def the, the, the term you're looking for is iteration. And there's a difference between iteration and replicability, <clears throat> or the difference between a series, each of one is a little different, versus stamping out the same one. And I think that's a, a, <clears throat> a clearly one of the urban design questions is, um, you know, what can you reuse versus what do you need to invent? Or, you know, what can be applied anywhere versus what can only be applied in certain places? So. Uh, I would totally agree. This appears to be uh, a strategy that has already been uh, uh, globally circulated. Um, uh, <clears throat> and so that is deeply problematic from, from our point of view. But can you say, for example, taking, I guess there's no similar space in the world, but taking a very um, crowded space with commerce oriented and um, pedestrianize it and maybe do some other iteration on it, does that consider scaling it vertically, horizontally? No, I think scaling vertically has, the, the, their, their goal is not, I mean, they say this in a very simple, almost simplistic way, that, <clears throat> that they're going, that this whole thing has to, through the Department of Transportation and its leaders, they wanted to uh, allow the DOT to plan and design in a people-focused, rather than form-centric way. I have to admit that's kind of sophomoric because they're, they're overlapping categories and they're certainly not, not a useful um, distinction, but it is a distinction that we have to respect that people see. <clears throat> and I would say from a form-centric way, if I were to, uh, can I do this? Can I crop the image? <clears throat> 
no, I can't do that here. But if we were to like, um, I will. If we were to cut this image off, <clears throat> I could open Photoshop and, but never mind. If we just cut off the image at, from at the top of the umbrella, <clears throat> I would say you could be anywhere. And if you travel the world, I'm sure you see this. I mean, I, I've seen pictures, whoa, all right, who's doing something there? <clears throat> you know, if you see pictures of entertainment spaces in Qatar or in Calcutta or in Moscow, I mean, this is, where are you doing? Thank you. Um, you're hired. Oh, I see. I, I, now they're pointing out to me that I could be doing it. So, okay, never mind. Um, <clears throat> and so um, we, we, um, we, replica, replicability, as in repetition, is clearly uh, possible, even with some minor changes. But I, I want to go on, because <clears throat> I want to <clears throat> get um, to where I want to bring out one piece of this, which is the, these authors are very insistent on this process, I'm, and I'm trying to uh, be sympathetic. And I'm, I, you know, I've always been, you know, it's a good challenge to our thinking. I'm going to read this part again. Uh, uh, David, just one sec. <clears throat> the tactical urbanism of this sort loosens rigid social and institutional norms that are enforced through urban design. So <clears throat> um, that is their goal. That's what the, the, the vertical scaling is. It's how do institutions change? How do the, the people who make the regulations, how do the people who make the laws, how do the businesses who invest in uh, uh, um, additions to public spaces like the, the businesses that support the Times Square bid. And how does the original idea of, of pedestrianization, which in some ways is like, let's make it easier for people to walk, how does that scale up the bureaucratic political ladder? That is their measure of a kind of success, is that commoning is not just something that takes place horizontally at a, at a particular sector, but but that it engages institutions th uh, that are above the, its scale and scope. <clears throat> that is a really good hypothetical. 